All right, welcome everyone uh, to my first demo video. So I'm here in my uh, hotel room in Hawaii. I haven't quite uh, joined my friends yet. I'll be flying in a couple of days uh, to their island. Um, but I have been uh, here and working on my projects. Uh, so it, it has helped a lot that I made it on a video and set some goals for myself uh, and um, uh, you know, have, have have this moment of this this first uh, demo video to work towards uh, because I, I did make uh, some progress. So uh, this video will be uh, will be starting off with a demo. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about what I learned this week, and then I have some musings on programming language innovations that I didn't get to in the first video. Also because I wanted to keep it um, uh, you know fairly short. But uh, I figured it would be good to expand a little bit. Um, and it would hopefully inform my, uh, my, my next work, what I'm going to look at. So let's start with the demo. So I had these, uh, these goals. Um, uh, so this, this was the, the goal for, for, my, for my previous week. And this, this was, these were the goals for, uh, for this week. Um, uh, and so my uh, main goal was to make a WebVis panel. Um, one WebVis panel in C++. And I had a fun goal of uh, also recording another episode of my Robot Club series. If you haven't seen that, uh, check them out. I didn't quite get to that uh, this week, but um, uh, maybe maybe some other time. So if you remember, WebVis is, um, uh, is a robotics tool um, that we used at Cruise, that we developed at Cruise to, to visualize um, robotics data, uh, primarily from the self-driving cars there, but also from other places. And so this is, uh, this is the panel that I try to recreate in a very, very small way, in a very constrained, uh, hacky way. So here we are looking at a point cloud uh, from a uh, data set that I found online. I think it's from uh, some, some course on self-driving cars. Um, I think it's on the uh, WebVis uh, homepage. So if you if you want to play with it, you can um, you can use that. Uh, yeah, you can go to the WebVis homepage and and uh, play with it there. And you can see uh, what what happens, right? So we can scrub back and forth, and you can kind of see the car driving. There's also another car here uh, that is obscuring the view of the lidar, so you can see sort of its shadow being projected in the rings there. So this is a, a very typical lidar image, uh, a very typical lidar point cloud seen uh, from above. Uh, but you can see that as we scroll through this, that it's fairly slow to do so, and that is because even though we spent uh, an enormous amount of time on the WebVis team uh, optimizing this particular workflow, in particular uh, looking at uh, uh, big point clouds, um, it's, uh, it's still rather slow. And so what I'm going to show is, uh, is a very uh, simplified version of this um, that implements, yeah, just, just this, this same mechanic, but in C++. So here uh, we have the same thing. You can see it's, it's very, very fast. Uh, it doesn't look quite the same, and it's completely hard-coded to only work um, with this particular point cloud message. Uh, but I didn't cheat that much. I uh, I basically followed, uh, for the most part, as you know, as a, uh, for the most part, it's generic, right? For the most part, we could use this for other things, but it's it's, it's just missing a lot of features. So it's, che it's cheating a little bit in that we have fewer features, and therefore it's faster. Uh, but it's it's just so much faster that you know just just a couple of extra features aren't going to make up for that, and that is just because it's so much uh, faster to to run this in C plus plus. I think um, I also wanted to make a WebAssembly version of this, so I compiled the same code base to to this WebAssembly version. So this is uh, compiled using mscripten. It kind of has all this stuff around it right now that is not strictly necessary. You can completely customize what your final HTML page looks like, but this is just the default. And you can see it runs uh, a tad slower. I don't know if that's noticeable on vid video, uh, but it's it's almost it's almost the same, and it's uh, it's still uh, it's very very fast as well, way faster than what what we had here. And so I wanted to do that. First of all, to prove to myself that it is indeed much faster if you do it this way. Um, I wanted to learn what uh, what is involved, uh, and we'll we'll get to those learnings in a second. Um, and I wanted to, um, um, yeah, just 
just just get a feel for if you just do this in C++ versus other programming languages, how does that feel like? What what does that look like? So uh, so that's the demo. That's what I accomplished uh, this week. It's just this uh, this very very small demo, but it has a couple of different components to it, right? It has the the parsing of a ROS bag, which I implemented completely from scratch. Um, it has the the 3D rendering, so this is using OpenGL. Um, it has this uh, this slider, this user interface component to it, which is uh, 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 from this library called uh, uh, Dear I Am uh, GUI. Um, which stand for immediate mode GUI, I think, a graphical user interface. Um, and so it has it has a couple of components. It has the re yeah the reading of uh, like file handling, um, and uh, uh, yeah, there's there's one more notable thing actually. Let's drag in a file from scratch. So it's using this demo bag, which is about uh, yeah seven hundred and thirty megabytes. And so if I drag that into our WebVis uh, version, so the original JavaScript version, you can see it takes quite a while to load. It's and this is actually multi-threaded, so this is uh, the loading is happening in a separate thread, so that we don't block when we uh, when we scroll back and forth here. Um, and it will wrap around and start there, uh, since uh, our playback position started off there. And if you if you look at what what we had here, right? So uh, this is the loading, and it's a little bit slower now because WebVis is also loading. Uh, uh, if you if you s go back to to the uh, <laughs> to the first time I opened, it was a little bit faster. So let's see. Uh, so WebVis has finished loading. If I load this again, it should be a little bit faster still. So boom, there you go. So you don't even need to make it multi-threaded because it just loads it so fast in the first place uh, that I didn't even bother with that. Uh, if, even though I don't think that that should be too difficult to add using uh, um, just uh, the standard uh, threading functionality in C++. So, um, so yeah, that's that's for the demo. Um, let's see what I learned. So, the first thing, right? I I, I tweeted this um, uh, a few days ago because I thought, yeah, it's it's interesting, right? It's like. Um, uh, I always had this feeling with the web stack that there's there's so much there, right? Like you have to learn sort of layer upon layer of things. There's like uh, you start with HTML and CSS, and now you have a page that kind of looks nice, and then you have to add JavaScript to uh, to make it work well. But then there's so much in this old JavaScript world, right? Like just TypeScript and React and Vue and different build systems and package managers, and you can run stuff. Um, uh, outside of the browser using Node, and then uh, CSS itself is also a very, very complicated system. Um, so there's a lot there. But then when you start getting into this native world, it's even worse, right? Like, first of all, you have to pick a programming language, and they're very different, right? You can do something like this in Python if you would want to, and there's sort of ways to make that fast because it has, like, um, uh, bindings to C++ libraries and so on. Uh, but even if you just use C++, there's like all these different things that you have to consider, and uh, none of yeah, they don't always work well together. Uh, especially if you want to then compile it to um, to WebAssembly. So it's definitely not an out of the box experience where you say, okay, let me just. Uh, 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 download my React Bootstrap app or something, right? Like, or, or what is it called? This uh, Create React app um, is sort of the default go-to where you just download that. It, it sets you up with all the things that you need and you're off to the races. You have to make a lot of decisions um, or at least it wasn't obvious to me, right? Like it wasn't clear coming into this ecosystem, like, okay, this is the way to go, right? Like if you download... Um, or like if you go to any sort of tutorial, they say, oh, th there's like these five different things that you can choose from for this part of the system and just choose one of them. Or like, uh, we, we will use this one in the tutorial, but it's fine to use something else. It's like, okay, <laughs> I don't know, right? Like, is uh, is this the best thing for what I'm going to do? So I ended up just choosing the most popular uh, things in, in most cases or what seemed the most popular. But even that, um, I think a part of this is it's, it's a very old ecosystem, right? Um, like some of these... APIs uh, are shipped with the operating system. Um, uh, some of them are just there, even though they're like 20 years old, uh, but still everyone uses them. I think part of it is because there isn't really a good standard package manager that's starting to um, 
be um, be some standardization around that. But uh, um, yeah, that's that's definitely very different because if you have um, a standard package manager, you can just look at what is the most popular one, and then everyone just starts using that, and then um, it just gets really good. And then uh, sometimes you have an upstart, like a new type of uh, library that uh, takes it, its place over time if it's clearly better. Um, but you can at least get get a bit more of a feeling for what's uh, what's popular. Uh, a lot of a lot of them are paid. A lot of libraries I, I didn't up end up using any any of those. But uh, it's it's very common that you see uh, a library that is a GPL licensed, uh, so it's uh, open source. But your program also has to be open source, or you can pay for a commercial license, and that's a pretty common dual licensing model. Um, I think that's actually kind of good in many ways because that way people can actually earn some money uh, making libraries. Um, whereas in the web world, a lot of it is sponsored by companies, uh, which is also nice, but you have to kind of get the support of a uh, relatively uh, big enough company or a lot of uh, uh, people have to kind of sponsor you uh, on Patreon or on GitHub or something and, and pay you money directly. But um uh, I don't. I don't know if if people there, there's very few people who can actually make a living from that. Okay. So anyway, um, uh, yeah. Even with this, even using the most popular things, I still had to add a lot of hacks and uh, if devs and so on, especially for compiling it to WebAssembly. So the whole WebAssembly stack, um, it's it's really good. It's really cool, uh, but it has a long way to go. So one of the things I ran into, for example is uh, uh, I wanted to be able to drag in a file just like I did with uh, this version of WebVis um, and then use that file handle directly, but that's not really possible with uh, with the current setup. Um, there are some PRs open that, that could make it possible, but there's clearly a bunch of work to be done there uh, on, the, um, on the tooling side. Um, so for now, I had to just copy everything into memory before I could use the file. Uh, which is not so great. You can't use uh, uh, exceptions, uh, so some C++ libraries you can't use. Uh, now, luckily, most of the popular libraries are C libraries, right? So, so that means that you can use them in many uh, other languages as well. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, there are, are some good... I, I did run into this. I wanted to use a C++ library that I came across, but then I saw it uses exceptions, and so you can't really use it. Um, because whenever you get an exception, it will. Uh, you can either sort of turn on support for exceptions, but uh, it will make your program much slower, uh, or it can just bail out whenever any exception happens, even if you catch it. Uh, and that is because the uh, WebAssembly, uh, the uh, VM, doesn't actually support exceptions yet. Uh, even that that is in the works, so that that will change in the future. Uh, another learning was that um, I really miss CSS. <laughs> it's uh, kind of surprising, actually, right? Like there's all these other things, but I think all the other things that I mentioned so far can kind of be paved over, right? I haven't looked too too much into abstractions that say, you know, here's, here's one nice abstraction and just use this and it will, you know, solve your problem for 95%. And then for the final 5%, you can kind of drop down into the libraries that we use underneath. Um, I haven't looked into that Um they must be out there, right? Uh, actually, actually I'll, I'll mention one of them that I briefly looked into a little bit later, uh, but I haven't looked too much into it. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, that's, and it's it's like a lot of this stuff is immature, right? But it's, uh, uh, or like the WebAssembly stuff is immature and like a, a lot of these things are just not, not great out of the box, but that can all be fixed relatively. Yeah, it's, it's fairly straightforward. Um, in some in some way, but um, but CSS is something that that I miss the most. Uh, I don't know if there are any libraries that um, maybe implement a subset of CSS or maybe have a sort of simplified version of CSS. But most of the things that I, uh, I came across uh, are either native um, native GUI components, right? So it will look like your operating system, and that's not what I want, right? Like I want something like with CSS where you just design your own uh, buttons and it will look the same on every system. So that is the way the web works a little bit, right? Like 
it like by default it will have some styling that is specific to to your operating system but a lot of people especially for complicated applications like this people will um, uh, create sort of their their own things so that is very popular but i don't like that that much uh, and then the other um, and especially also because I want to use it uh, in the context of OpenGL, right? And in the context of WebAssembly. So I want to have an OpenGL context and do everything in there, ideally. Um, and then the other style is uh, basically overlays for games. So this is really uh, sort of a, a standard tool that you can use in your, in your games. And you can quickly add some sliders and things uh, and some uh, input boxes and stuff to debug your game. But it's not necessarily super suited to make a um, client-facing, uh, user-facing application uh, out of. And I don't know exactly how well you can style all of this. I haven't uh, really tried um, so much yet. So that's maybe a, a nice next step. And there, I have found a few other libraries. There's, there's some that actually... Uh, include like a, brow a browser or a stripped down version of a browser, but they are mostly uh, those dual licensed um, uh, commercial uh, projects. Um, so that's that's kind of a no go if you want, yeah, to to make something that that will be very popular. Uh, sort of an application framework that lots of people are gonna use, uh, and then th there there are some other ones that I haven't looked into too much yet that seem a little bit less popular maybe, but that uh, that might be uh, promising. Uh, so this is one that I want to check out there. I, I have, I have a, a small a small list of things that looked um, uh, somewhat good. Because the other thing is um, most, <laughs> not not to diss the people who work on these things, but for most of these projects, when you look look at their screenshots uh, and see what people do, do with it, it just, looks bad <laughs> so um you know i want to use a project that is developed by people who i don't know uh maybe have some sort of design background or who have at least worked with uh designers or, um, uh, folks like that where it's like okay this this actually looks good let's <laughs> uh you know we, we can actually ship this to uh to customers um, and then my final learning was that um, C++ itself, I was, um, uh, I haven't programmed too much in it yet. Like this wasn't a very big program that I wrote in it, but um, it wasn't too bad. I had, um, you know, I, I have a decent amount of practice in it. And so I, um, I was fairly familiar with all the things I needed to do. And, but it surprised me a little bit because, um, yeah, I didn't run, run into too many C++ specific issues. Okay, so that is it for my learning. So now let's go into the musings on programming languages. Um, so if you remember from my initial video, uh, I had a couple of projects listed out uh, and projects three and four related to programming languages. So project three was like, okay, can we find a programming language that is kind of in between C++ and Rust and so on on the one hand and higher level languages like JavaScript and Python and Java and so on on the other hand. And then number four was maybe uh, interoperability between programming languages. There's not really something where you can just drop very easily uh, combine different languages. So... I was thinking about this because building this, especially missing CSS, for example, um, made made me think about uh, the, the the two possible directions that that you can take when you build a new project, right? Like there's sort of the webvis direction, which is uh, you have a JavaScript code base, but you use uh, WebAssembly in some small parts. Web performance is really critical, uh, or you take the approach that I took with this project where you uh, have a completely C++ code base uh, and then you compile it to WebAssembly and maybe you try to compensate for some of the things that you lose from not being in a browser anymore, right? So there's there's a lot of those things, right? Like uh, uh, the, the web gives you a lot of things. Uh, universal deployment, everyone can just type in a URL. It's very easy to use. The styling is really great. There's package management. Some of the things that I mentioned earlier. Um, but you get performance, right? And so if we really care about performance, and so for applications where we do really care about performance, this, this is kind of the way to go. But uh, 
for basically everything else, uh, option number one has a lot going for it, right? Um, it is just so much easier in so many in so many ways. Um, so, yeah, that um, yeah, and and then the one thing to note with with option two is you, you don't uh, another benefit besides performance is uh, that it can also run natively. Uh, and you get well even more performance. So I guess that is mostly a perform uh, performance benefit. But you can also access the native APIs of of the computer and so on. Um, although you have to abstract a little bit over that still. So okay, so let's uh, go back to the languages in between, right? So what is the key difference, right, uh, between those compiled, low-level, more static languages, and what we consider more dynamic, high-level, but slower languages. And the key, I think, like or one way to look at it is uh, typing and memory management, right? And by typing, I mean, um, does this compile directly to machine code where each operation, you know exactly sort of the type of data structure that you're operating on, or is it dynamic, like in the case of uh, JavaScript and Python and so on, where at the runtime uh, you have to uh, figure out a lot of stuff about the actual objects that you're working with. So uh, roughly you have the spectrum, right? So the highest level roughly, right, are like Python and JavaScript and so on, where there's dynamic typing and it's garbage collected. Um, and then you drop down a little bit and you get maybe a little faster uh, because now you have static typing, so you don't have to resolve anything at runtime around what types you're dealing with. And so now this is uh, things like uh, the, the, the Java VM and languages that run uh, on it. And then... And then there's basically this big gap here, right? So here, here's the gap that we want to fill in the middle. And then uh, you get to uh, static typing and what's called uh, RAII. So that means uh, resource acquisition is initialization, I believe. Uh, and it's basically a mechanism of uh, ownership of memory. So every memory um, uh, region on the heap is owned by a particular... Uh, other thing, right, uh, by a particular function or by a particular other object on the heap. And there, the language gives you some some way of dealing with this, right? And so in C++, you have, especially since C++11, um, there's the whole world of move semantics um, that, uh, that do this quite nicely, but it doesn't give you any guarantees, right? So you can, if you make mistakes, you can still do unsafe things. Um, Whereas basically, basically uh, up until here, it's uh, it's it's all relatively speaking safe, right? You can't uh, leak memory or override memory that you didn't intend, unless you're, I don't know. There's, I'm, I'm sure that there's ways to do it if you kind of use some low level APIs, but um, generally speaking, they are safe. And then C++ is the first one that is sort of not safe, uh, but it still gives you uh, quite a bit of. Um, tools to to deal with your memory and then rust i would characterize as um, c plus plus done right right so it's like a safe version of c plus plus and it also fixes a lot of uh the the craft that c plus plus has accumulated over the many years so it's a sort of much cleaner version of it um and safe a lot safer um test the borrow checker and all that and then, um, and then you can go even lower where you don't even have this RAII uh, system. And um, the language basically says you're on your own, right? You have to figure it out. Uh, and so that's C. And then there's a ZIG, which is kind of up and coming. Um, I would characterize that as C done right, <laughs> right? So that's, that's, uh, that seems to be kind of uh, its space. Um, and then there's some more recent considerations, right? So, um, pref like, uh, uh, way back when, you didn't really have to worry so much about, about this kind of stuff, but this has become more important in recent years. So it's become uh, relatively, uh, compared to the, uh, the speed of the CPU, memory access has become pretty slow. It's been a bit, uh, a bit stagnant behind uh, the increase of... Um, uh, so basically, or am I saying that right? I'm not sure. Anyway, so um, 
uh, you have like caches in the CPU and whenever something is in the cache that's like really fast and these caches have become pretty big, uh, many megabytes um, or even, yeah, I don't know how big they are these days. Um, and there's like different levels of them. But if you have a cache miss and you actually have to go to real memory, that's really slow. And so it's become quite important to uh, write your uh, memory uh, related code in such a way that um, you access the memory. Um, you, you you try to optimize for, uh, for hitting the cache as, as much as possible. And that has a couple of implications, right? Like standard allocations, uh, like what you would do in pretty much all of these cases, right? Unless you're really um, precise about it with this manual uh, memory management or you can do it in C++ and so on too. Is uh, you allocate memory for an object and it just it just goes somewhere, right? Like there's some algorithm um, that that determines where it goes, uh, and then you deallocate it, and now you have some fragmentation. There's like a gap there, and then maybe when later you allocate something again, like they try to fill it, um, but your memory layout, everything is all over the place. Um, memory indirection is another problem, right? If you have like a data structure uh, where you have an object and that object contains um, maybe a, a, an array of another a set of objects, then uh, oftentimes you will um, you will use pointers to those objects, which means that they can be in a completely different place in memory. And so if you're dealing with these kinds of um, uh, structures in memory a lot, you might have to kind of like jump back and forth in memory all the time. And, uh, and so you get a lot of cache miss, uh, misses. And then you have um, sort of other things where it's, uh, it's become a lot more efficient to operate on a couple of, um, of on particular data structures um, uh, at the same time. Okay, so that is sort of um, the uh, the spectrum that we're talking about, right? And we have to figure out what what would fit fit in here. And one observation that that I had is there's a trend towards static typing, right? Like if you look at JavaScript, uh, there's now TypeScript, and it's very popular because typing doesn't just give you faster code, right? Um, it also gives you a uh, more maintainable code base. And so TypeScript actually just gives you that. It doesn't give you any performance benefit. Uh, there's no, um, nothing in the compiler that, like it, it might produce codes that can be better jitted, uh, better compiled um, uh, just in time. Um, so yeah, so that uh, not so many dynamic uh, runtime uh, inference has, has to be done. Uh, but there's nothing like inherent in the in the language that is uh, that, that's making it fast. People just use it because it gives them uh, better uh, better code organization and prevents bugs, right? Uh, similarly, Python three now has st st static type checking. A very similar story there. Um, you you don't see it for everything, right? Especially not for if you do some like Jupyter notebook scripting or something. And you just want to write a couple of lines. You don't want to add type annotations everywhere. Um, so that's that's a caveat to this observation. But uh, I think it is okay, right? Like it's okay. Like ideally we can forget a little bit about uh, dynamic typing and say, okay, st static typing is, is pretty good, right? Um, a lot of people, especially for the type of project that we're targeting here. Although I also had, if you remember my project number two was about of the Jupyter notebook style. So it, it would be nice if the language can support a lighter touch on the typing. Um, but by and large, uh, static typing is, uh, it's pretty okay. Um, so that, that's an observation. Uh, so that, that kind of, you know, we don't have to worry maybe so much about the typing side of things. And so then there's the memory management side. So let's uh, let's look at a couple of uh, languages that I'm uh, kind of excited about. So the first one is uh, is Lobster, and Lobster was made um, many years ago. I think like a decade ago uh, by my friend uh, Wouter, and he uh, wanted to make a language uh, specifically for uh, uh, for developing games. Uh, and it's funny because this language, Jai, kind of has the same, <laughs> the same goal. It's also specific for games. And it makes sense, right? Because games are very heavy um, 
heavy applications, very very performance intensive, and they use graphics a lot. So there's a lot of overlap between the goals that game developers have and what what I have with uh, uh, developing applications like WebVis. And so, um, Lobster is a very very interesting language uh, because it has three three great innovations and also a bunch of smaller uh, innovations that uh, if you combine them all together, I think Wouter has done uh, a real, really great job of um, making a very coherent language where the sum of, is bigger than its parts. But um, for us, it's it's interesting still to look at the parts individually because uh, they, they can be a little bit orthogonal. So one of the things is uh, the, the part where there's generic types everywhere. And that basically means that if you have uh, some sort of function, and I should probably do a video on you know, actually comparing these languages where we can look at them in a bit more detail. But imagine that you have like some sort of function and it takes an argument, uh, but you you don't add a type annotation. You don't say, okay, this argument has to be uh, uh, you know, a, a vector or this argument has to be, um, yeah, I don't know. You, you, don't, you don't add a type argument. Um, and you, uh, you can still call it with various different, um, uh, different types. And if the things that you do with that object within that function support whatever type you gave to it, then that should work, right? And that's the same as in C++. You can add a template um, uh, a template f for, for any function or class or whatever. Uh, the difference with Lobster is it's implicit everywhere. So by default, you don't really have to write types anywhere and the, um, the compiler will figure out uh, sort of all the different possible uh, code paths uh, that can be taken uh, and what, uh, what the machine code should, should be in those cases. So a consequence is that you could have um, bigger executables because a lot more code might have to be generated, uh, but apparently it's not too uh, too big of a concern. Um, I haven't looked at at the numbers yet, but uh, um, uh, yeah, you can also imagine that usually you don't have that many types in your application, so uh, or that many types that can fit a particular function signature. So in in practice, it should be pretty okay. Um, and it's really cool because it's, it really makes it so that you don't have, yeah, you can uh, work with it in a sort of scripting way. It feels very, very much like Python, but it's a completely compiled, uh, statically typed uh, language. Uh, so that's, that's pretty cool. But like we said before, maybe it's not the most important thing uh, for us to, to worry about, right? Like if you're building something like Webfish, you probably do actually want a lot of types in a lot of places just to prevent bugs. Um, and, and so uh, the biggest innovation I think is this one, uh, compile time reference counting. And this is just, it's really cool. And it kind of depends on, on, on this system here. It works in a very similar way. So roughly speaking, the way that it works is you can think of um, gar garbage collection traditionally, um, you keep track of how many references there are to a particular object. And if that number goes to zero, uh, it disappears, right? You deallocate it. Uh, but you have the a problem of cycles, right? So you might have uh, uh, a doubly linked list, for example, right? And every object has like a cycle. There's like uh, if you have two two items in your linked list, uh, you you have a forward pointer and a backwards pointer, and so they always have like uh, at least one, uh, usually two, uh, other um, objects that hold a reference uh, to, uh, to them, and so they will never get uh, deallocated, even if you don't use your linked list anymore. And so there's usually in a garbage collector there's a, uh, some sort of sweeping algorithm, so it kind of goes through all of your objects and detects if they're cycles and then removes them. So if you go to reference counting, you say, okay, um, there won't be, uh, we just won't do that sweeping part. Um, you just have to make sure that there are no cycles. And if there are any cycles, you have to manually um, deal with them, right? You have to manually uh, remove them. Uh, otherwise, your stuff won't get deallocated. So this makes Lobster, in that sense, an unsafe language, right? Like um, memory might leak, but it has some stuff in it where it makes sure that uh, uh, 
you get like an error message uh, at runtime uh, at the end of yeah when your program ends if there were uh, any cycles if there was any memory leak so it, it kind of does it if you compile it in debug mode it does it at the end uh, I believe and so it's still fairly easy to to deal with uh, but you do have to think about it a little bit um, but it's still at runtime right uh, reference counting happens at runtime it's like every time you um, uh, you remove a pointer uh, to to an object. You have to check. Okay, is the reference count zero now? Uh, and then, if so, then deallocate it. Uh, but it, it, there's a cost there of uh, first of all tracking these reference counts, and second, uh, looking them up every time uh, uh, you might need to deallocate them. So th there's a bit of overhead there. And so what Wouter's Wout um, uh, big um, um, innovation is here is doing that at compile time and the big insight there I think is that you can you can view um, uh, these reference counts as as part of the type right so whenever you go into a function that function will add either uh, take over the ownership um, of that particular object so that's basically saying the uh, uh, the function that called into uh, uh, into your function doesn't want it anymore here have it. Uh, which means that now you're responsible for doing the deallocation at some point, or it's borrowing, right? Uh, so um, uh, it temporarily uses um, uses the object, but then it, you know the ownership is still at the uh, uh, at the original function, and this actually makes sense, right? Like in, in C plus plus or something, if if you have um, I don't know like an object like like a message, this might be a type, right? Like a message M. Uh, you can say, well, uh, right, if, if I have some, some sort of function, um, uh, do something with my message, right, uh, then I can either, um, uh, well, by default, you, you can kind of give it um, uh, a copy. That is what it will do by default. Or you can say uh, it will borrow it. Right, or you can say this is a move. <laughs> and this was added in C++11, but... Um, uh, I think, but um, uh, it is part of the type, like literally, right? It's it's like uh, uh, this is how how the C plus plus compiler also deals with it. And then similarly in um, um, in Rust, the whole uh, borrow checker like looks at the type uh, of uh, of each of the things and makes sure that certain invariants aren't violated. Uh, but what Lobster does is it, is it says, well, we had this um, generic type system anyway, so. You know, if we call a function in multiple places and in one place uh, the caller wants you to borrow it and in the other place they want you to take ownership of it, we'll just generate two, two versions of the, of the function. And um, yeah, just like we do with any other type. And he has a bunch of heuristics of how to figure out uh, what, what the right thing to do is in different cases. But uh, in practice, it means that you... Uh, I think he had some statistic where he tried it on a bunch of his own games that he had written in his language, and it eliminated uh, something like 95% of all runtime reference counting. So it's not like you completely eliminate the runtime overhead with this, but you eliminate 95% of it, which is pretty good. Um, so, yeah, I, I believe you still need reference counts, for example, if you, uh, if you have a pointer... Um, uh, in an object that is on, on the heap, right? Because at that point, yeah, the object is on the heap. Anyway, uh, there's 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 cases in which you can't uh, you can't eliminate it, um, but uh, but it's pretty good, and I think this is a major major innovation. And in fact, there's several languages that have uh, since adopted it, um, mostly experimental ones. Uh, and then the other thing is, I mentioned earlier that it's really hard to do stuff with. Uh, um, OpenGL and like all the different uh, frameworks she has to deal with there uh, and Lobster abstracts over a lot of that stuff right it abstracts over the different operating systems in the same way that something like this C++ standard library does but um, Lobster takes a much wider uh, perspective here where it abstracts over a lot of graphics related stuff um, I think that this is mostly orthogonal <laughs> To, to having a programming language, right? Like it, it makes sense if you have a programming language that is specifically focused on building games, but there's no reason that you couldn't also have this as a, as a separate library or something. 
uh, so I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll have to do some investigation what, uh, what the good uh, abstractions are there. But if there are none, then maybe we can uh, uh, take, take what Lobster ha- has and put it in the library or something. I don't know. Um, but it, it does work nicely um, for a language with this goal, of course. Uh, but it's a little bit orthogonal. And then there's um, uh, another language with uh, the same uh, goal, essentially, uh, making a language that is good for writing games in. Uh, and it takes a quite different approach. It feels a lot more uh, like C. Uh, it was developed by, it's still being developed, it's not open source yet, but I'm in the private beta, um, uh, by Jonathan Blow, who is an acclaimed um, uh, game developer. Um, and he he basically said that uh, uh, he doesn't want to write in C++ anymore, but he wants to, you know, keep making keep making games. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. He's had enough success with his uh, uh, previous games that he could fund the development of a new language. And he's basically doing it for himself primarily, right? To just make his own life. Uh, happier, I think that is uh, also uh, the case for <laughs> for Wouter with uh, Lobster, um, and so he's uh, developing Jai, uh, and there's um, uh, there's one particular there's, there's a couple of interesting innovations around compile time, um, uh, running code at, at compile time, which a couple of other languages are are also doing. Um, so yeah, there's this thing about there's there's a couple there's a couple of things that that are quite nice in it and they work together. Better. One that is interesting to us, if we're looking primarily at memory management, is this thing called a temporary allocator, which is just an interesting idea. So instead of uh, uh, saying okay, you know, we have to figure out a clever algorithm to figure out what to do, and even if you do that, it's still kind of unsafe because you have to worry about uh, cycles and, and stuff like that. It's like, okay, let's just simplify stuff and say, um, we are just going to allocate your things onto on one big heap and uh, it's never going away. Um, uh, so we're just leaking memory all over the place until we just get rid of it all at once. And so John's claim is that, uh, or his, his idea there is that um, in most programs, there's a natural place to do this. And he's targeting games with this, where there's um, the natural place is when you've rendered a frame. Uh, then when you go render the next frame, you know, you can allocate stuff again and then just wipe it out. Um, and... Um, get rid of it all at once and there's only a few things that have to survive right like this uh there's the the state of your game or the, the state of your program um that um uh, that has to survive but usually that is a relatively small amount of stuff and you have to be really careful with that stuff anyway um because it's very easy to make mistakes with uh, with um with your game state anyway and you know you have to do all these things uh, where you have to be able to serialize it and deserialize it. And it, it's the stuff that you have to be more careful with anyway. And so you have to explicitly say, okay, I want to allocate things that survive uh, this temporary allocator. But most of the stuff you'll just use the temporary allocator and poof, just uh, wipe it out in one clean swoop. And so, um, yeah, you might have to reason about it a little bit more than with Lobster's algorithm, right? Like with Lobster's algorithm, you just have to worry about not making cycles and it will tell you at runtime in the debug mode if you've done so, and then you can go fix that. But here you have to be a little bit more mindful about what what is a good time in my program to wipe stuff out, right? Like if I'm building a web server, maybe I'm making like a, a, a temporary uh, a buffer for every... Uh, request that I get and then do my allocation there and then when the request is resolved I, I throw it away um, uh, in the graphical user interface it's probably a, a bit similar to games but it might be slightly different still um, so you have to you have to think about it a little bit more carefully uh, but in a sufficiently large system you have to think about the, uh, your memory management um, your state management anyway is sort of the claim. And it's 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 probably easier than C++ and Rust, right? Where you actually have to really worry about what 
uh, who's the owner of um, of each piece of memory and do we borrow or transfer ownership here and it's like no it's, it, we just don't worry about that we just wipe it all out when uh, um, when we're done uh, rendering and another potential benefits that I haven't seen in any of the other ideas um, is uh, it might actually be better for cache locality right so we talked about this earlier because um, if you if you allocate everything sort of linearly uh, right next to each other in memory, there's a very good chance that if you have to refer back to something, uh, that it's still in the cache because you don't get like sort of these little gaps and sort of these things pointing back and forth. It's all sort of nicely arranged in memory. And so maybe you can just, um, uh, yeah, get get better cache hits and then you wipe it out and you just start over. And um, yeah, it's it's all fairly local. And of course, this, uh, this doesn't, uh, solve the issue of um, uh, maybe fragmentation in the heap uh, for things uh, for for your uh, program state that does survive um, uh, the temporary allocator, um, but you have hopefully a bit less pressure on that now, right? You have less stuff that you allocate in the heap uh, in general, and so it might be um, uh, it might be favorable for uh, for. Uh, uh, for, for for caching those those things too, so the one thing that would be interesting here is to see maybe some sort of uh, way to quantify this. Maybe take take a large enough application. But the problem is, of course, that Jai is, is very new and it's only in private beta and so on. So uh, we might not uh, not have a good real world application that we can try this on. But it would be very interesting to see um, what if we would do this stuff. Sort of in the traditional way, how uh, how uh, how much faster would we get from using uh, this linear memory? Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's again not not guaranteed safety, but it's a very pragmatic approach. Um, and and one of the things that is interesting here is maybe uh, like already with the lobster algorithm, we're seeing it. Uh, being uh, starting to get implemented in some other places, very very, uh, it's very slow going still. But um, it might be interesting to see how these ideas can interact with other ideas, right? Like, can you combine the idea of the temporary allocator with the idea of something like a Rust borrow check or something that can statically verify, um, like, oh, this is a temporary variable, but uh, you're still holding on to it. Uh, that's not okay, right? Um, I I I I I um, I think that would be interesting, sort of academically, <laughs> uh, to look at. I don't know um, uh, if if I'll have the time to uh, to really investigate that, but it's uh, it's kind of interesting. Um, there's not a language, so so uh, Nim. What what they do is also kind of interesting, where you can use different strategies. So you can say, um, yeah, I'm going to use. I, I want. Uh, I really care about safety, so I'm going to use a full garbage collector, even though I know that my code, you know, is trying to not make cycles and stuff like that. But just in case, because you know we're running a nuclear power plant or something, right? And then, uh, but you can also use uh, Lopsis algorithm. It's one of the languages that has basically implemented it. Um, and. Uh, uh, and get the speed. So it's interesting. I don't know if that's the way to go. It makes the language more complicated. Like how are the libraries going to be implemented? Are they going to assume that there's always a garbage collector or are they always going to assume that, the, that there's not? Um, how is that going to work exactly? I don't know. Um, and uh, it's interesting, right? Because like even, even in C++, for example, you can implement a lot of a lot of this stuff yourself, right? Like you could implement sort of a temporary allocator and use that everywhere. But if no, none of the libraries are going to use this, then um, what are you going to do, right? You you kind of have to use, uh, uh, like write everything yourself or use a system that is sort of a closed system where everything uses your garbage collector or whatever. So if it's not, yeah. So I, I, I don't know if that is really the way to go, but it's uh, it's kind of interesting to see uh, some people doing that. And then there's one more thing to say about um, a new language, right? Like, it's really hard to make them popular. So I'm looking at these experimental new languages um, 
and I'm thinking this is really, really cool and I'm very interested and it overlaps so much with the type of stuff that I'm doing, right? But is this actually the way to go? Probably not, but maybe. Um, that's, I think, one of the things I want to figure out. So I've started to think a little bit about this and I see three routes to success for a new programming language and I would love, you know, your thoughts on if there are uh, any others uh, or if these are wrong. Uh, so the first of, of them is if there's strong corporate backing, right? We've seen that with um, with a lot of the most recent popular programming languages. So Go has Google, Google behind it, uh, Rust has Mozilla behind it and so on. Um, the other one is if there's truly no other way to accomplish your goal, right? I think this is what made JavaScript popular in the first place, right? People wanted to do stuff on the web and you had to use either JavaScript or Flash, right? And so both were very popular and then Flash died because Apple killed it. I mean, they, they had, uh, um, there were all the issues with, with Flash, of course. But um, yeah, I mean, in, in many ways, these language like JavaScript is, was, Certainly at the time, not a fast language. It's still not super fast, but it's, it's way faster now than it was back then. But you had to use it, right? Uh, how else are you going to um, uh, do, do stuff on the web? And a lot of people wanted to make applications on the web because you get so, so, so many of the other benefits of easy distribution to, to users and so on, right? So if you wanted to accomplish your goals and make it like very easy for people to use your application, just you open a web browser, you had to use JavaScript and you still kind of do to a large extent. This is why I'm thinking about all this stuff. And then the other one is you can build a thin layer on top of an existing language. So this is um, the reason why this um, can make a language more successful is that there's a, there's a lower commitment, right? So I'm thinking about things like TypeScript. Uh, TypeScript actually also has strong corporate backing because it's uh, uh, backed by Microsoft. Uh, but if you remember way back when, um, there was CoffeeScript, right? And CoffeeScript is kind of a JavaScript dialect and it would compile directly to JavaScript. Um, and over time, a lot of the stuff that CoffeeScript had actually got implemented in JavaScript itself. So there was not really a need for CoffeeScript anymore. Uh, but yeah, it became popular, be I think in part because it was so easy to rip it out later if you needed to. Um, it was a fair, fairly thin layer. And so I think this is the most promising, actually, uh, if we're thinking about this stuff. You know, can we, can we accomplish our goals uh, of having something in between and maybe, you know, using some of these ideas here um, by uh, making a thin layer on top of an existing language that would make it a low commitment for people to try it out and they can just rip it out and compile back to the uh, language that we build on top of when they don't like it anymore. Uh, so that's uh, that's an interesting idea. Uh, I don't know where to, to go with that uh, quite yet, but um, that's, that's sort of the way I'm framing, I guess, like, like if, if, if I were running a business right now, right, it would be a really bad idea to do any of these things, but I'm not. Um, I'm basically trying to solve this problem and just trying to see where my curiosity takes me. And it's very tempting to say, okay, we have to write a new language for this. Uh, and I guess this is, this is a way for me to ground myself a little bit and say, um, let's not go overboard. Let's actually see like, if that is the right solution, then how can we make it um, uh, have the highest uh, chance of success? Okay, so those are my musings on programming languages. Let's uh, talk briefly about what my next goals might be because I uh, don't have any uh, quite yet written down for next week. Um, so I could go into uh, looking at the abstractions for, uh, uh, for rendering. So what I mentioned, uh, Lobster kind of gives you, there might be other libraries out there. Uh, I think that would be useful to look into and maybe, maybe try using one or a few of them. Um, I think it would be useful for me to go uh, a little bit deeper into GUIs. So I mentioned some libraries earlier that I uh, and that might bring some CSS type styling into um, uh, into the C plus plus world, and so I want to 
uh, play play with those, maybe implement something that a little bit more resembles a WebFizz uh, interface, right? Like maybe this loading bar here with with this hover state and with uh, where it can scrub, but also load and and maybe some of these uh, uh, these UI elements. Like how hard would it be to basically recreate what we see at the bottom here in um, uh, in in a C plus plus GUI library? That would be kind of Maybe yeah, maybe a good benchmark to see is this good enough for building complex uh, GUIs with uh, that look good. Um, and then another one is to uh, I, I build the same project that I built here in in some different programming languages, right? So uh, I could implement the same Rosfish thing in Rust and see how how that goes, or or in Lobster or Jai or Nim, right, and see what happens. So I think that would be useful to get a better sense uh, of those programming languages. So that would be mostly useful for, for my goal of um, uh, uh, figuring out a programming language that, 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 sits, that sits here. Um, and not so much maybe for um, figuring out how, uh, uh, how yeah, how, how, how to build um, something like WebFizz in um, in a native uh, language, but on the other hand, it would give me it would really solidify <laughs> how uh, how quickly or how how well I can deal with um, uh, implementing the same thing over and over. So it might be an interesting. Uh, it's it's sort of the uh, the equivalent. I think yeah, so someone sent this to me. I forgot to who sent it to me, but it's the equivalent of uh, playing skills on the piano, right? It's like a, uh, an interesting exercise that just solidifies your core skills. Uh, so I might uh, I might do that. Might even do it in in JavaScript um, just to get a fair comparison because um, this is a bigger application that has a lot of other stuff going on. And so it would be interesting to see a stripped down version and really do an apples to apples comparison. But I could also take take a different program, right? Like maybe a more notebook style uh, program, like like I mentioned earlier, or it can just take some smaller like toy examples that I could um, uh, implement in a couple of programming languages to get a feel for it. But I, I do think it's nice to have something that is uh, somewhat realistic. Uh, another thing that I can do is use what I've written so far in C++ and try to see how well the bindings work with other languages. So that would uh, get a little bit to my language interop goal. Um, so that's it. Uh, and, and I could do a combination of those things too, right? Maybe I can keep the some of the back part, the ROS back parsing in um, uh, uh, in C plus plus, and and do a um, uh, uh, write some bindings for it, but then still write some of this 3D rendering stuff in the language that I choose. So anyway, those those are some ideas. And then another idea is to really research these uh, different memory management innovations that I that I mentioned. So uh, I mentioned it would be interesting to look at. How much of a performance boost do you get from this temporary allocator? Like, is it really worth it? Like, I just, I know that it gives you performance benefit, but exactly how much? I don't have a good good enough sense of um, what would be the cost to the user, right? Of having to think about this more versus the benefit of your program is now even faster. Um, so it might be worth it, it might not be, or there might be, uh, some other trade-offs there that I just don't really understand yet. Um, and then also, I, like, Lobster's algorithm is really cool, but I don't know if it's, like, how much slower it actually is than RAII or how much faster it really is than a full uh, garbage-collected implementation. Like, it must sit somewhere in between, right? It still has some amount of runtime um, reference counting. Um, um, you know the claim is that it's it's a very low amount, but I I think it might be interesting to uh, to quantify that, um, and then to get back to my my idea of like a thin layer on top of an existing language, it might be interesting to try that. Um, I don't have a super concrete idea yet, but Lobster, for example, I think maps quite 
well to some other language. So I, I, I might I might look into that. Uh, then we would really get into the very dangerous realm of uh, me writing, uh, <laughs> trying to write a parse in a programming language, which is always very tempting. Um, so I don't know yet, but but something simple and scoped might be uh, might be worthwhile to at least explore. Um, um, if, even if it's just for, like I could also just implement for example, lobster's algorithm or like Jai's temporary allocator in some other language just manually and just see what do I run into just to learn a little bit more about them. I think that might be interesting for uh, uh, yeah, for research purposes. Uh, and if you have any suggestions, um, I would welcome that. I, I really liked how I had a very clear goal for this week. I don't, I don't think that there's quite quite a, a yeah a goal that is jumping out to me as clearly this time maybe uh next week should be more of a buffet of a couple of smaller scoped goals or maybe i should just pick a random one and just uh go go with it for a couple of days and then pick pick another one when i get bored with that so or if i run out of steam on that one so um uh we'll uh we'll we'll see how it goes i i, I still have this weekend to think about that so yeah, that is uh, that is pretty much it. This is uh, a pretty long video. If you're still here, thank you so much <laughs> for watching. I really appreciate um, uh, your support and um, uh, and the suggestions. Uh, I've definitely gotten some uh, some interesting suggestions after after the last video. So um, yeah, thanks and um, see you next week. I guess. Bye.